Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange, and thank you so very much for joining us. Lots to talk about again today. The American economy continues to struggle, and it makes you wonder if things will ever get back to where they once were. We'll also talk about Wisconsin politics. Despite cries from the left, Republican lawmakers continue pushing the agenda they promised they would. Will it come back to haunt them, though? And we'll talk about the death of Dr. Jack Kevorkian. First, let me introduce everyone. Newspaper columnist Joel McNally is with us. Kevin Fisher, longtime broadcaster, political analyst, and oftentimes a fill-in host on WISN Talk Radio. And tonight we have Denise Calloway, the coordinator of business and community partnerships for the Milwaukee Public School System. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, the first thing we'll talk about is the gloomy economic picture in the country. Wall Street took a beating this week. Fuel prices still sky high. Unemployment is up more than 9%. Few companies are hiring anybody. It makes you wonder if we're heading into yet another recession and whether this president is having any effect, positive or negative, on an economic recovery. Kevin, what do you think? Well, it started out, the, the year started out with some faint glimmer of hope. Every month we started hearing positive reports about uh, a recovery with more jobs being created and, and, and so forth. But the, these last two months have been just disastrous. And just this week you had the Consumer Confidence Index come out. And, and, and people have no faith or belief that the economy is going to uh, turn around soon. And, and who could blame them with unemployment going up? Jobs aren't there. Uh, wages aren't there. Wages haven't gone up consistently since Ronald Reagan was president. The housing <laughs> crisis continues. You can't buy a house if you don't have a job or if you have a job that pays crummy wages. Um, so I don't see this turning around very quickly. The economy is always the number one issue in a presidential race. It will be again in 2012. And, and I believe that there's just no a sense of urgency at the federal level to turn the economy around. Some tough decisions have to be made. We're spending far too much and we're digging ourselves deeper and deeper into debt, making job creation and, jo and, and economic recovery that much more difficult. So I can fully understand why the American public this week feels as grumpy and as, as pessimistic as they do because there are no signs that the economy is being revived. Denise, when, when things were good and Clinton was president, we all gave him credit. You know, mm. the economy is great. You know, eight years of peace and prosperity. On the other side of the coin, can we blame Obama for the condition the country's in right now? Well, I think that would be the easy thing to do, but I don't think that would be the correct thing to do. When we take a look at what happened to us, it, the, the impact of it was very sudden and sharp when we really hit that recession. But if we take a look at what had been happening, it really had been happening for more than a year and a half. So for us to really expect something that was that deep and as sharp of, a, of an impact on our economy to recover in a relatively short period of time, I, I don't think is realistic. If we take a look at what, the, we have some really significant, serious issues that we have to deal with. The one which I think is really driving everything, and I don't think we're going to see significant improvement until that changes, is the housing market. We have got a glut of foreclosed homes that are on the market. Um, and that is what's slowing down and eating up efforts for the economy to recover, I believe. Um, the other thing that we do have to take a look at is that the efforts that, that were made to try to stimulate the economy did have some impact. They did. Not what anybody would like to, to see, but they did provide some impact, and we did see unemployment go down at that particular point in time. Finally, I think the, the issue that we have and that we all know and we all agree with is that when we're going to see those jobs really increase, they're jobs that are going to come from the private sector. And for a variety of different reasons, the private sector is not hiring at the rate that we would expect. I think part of what we're seeing is that uh, credit is much tougher to come by than it was before all of this happened. So it's much harder for companies to access the capital they need to be able to expand and to hire new workers. And there's they're, they're a, there's still a nervous. Skittishness. That's why they're not creating jobs. They're they're still nervous. And you're right about credit being tight. It's tough to give loans to people who want to buy that first house when you're not sure they're going to be able to re repay that loan after that housing crisis. That and we and, went and guess why? Uh, because people don't have jobs. Uh, that's right. Yes, that's absolutely right. But, but you're absolutely wrong. <laughs> But what clearly is going on here, President Obama passed the biggest stimulus package he could pass, given Republicans in Congress 
voting against everything he wanted to do. Uh, there were economists at the time, remember this was in 2009, he passed a, a job stimulus bill, a huge one. But there were economists then who said it's not going to be enough. Uh, we're coming out of the worst economic situation in our history, second only to the Great Depression. And, and they said, come 2010 and 11, when that stimulus money runs out, we're going to need another kick because the truth of the matter is, if there's high unemployment, people aren't buying goods, they aren't buying services. Uh, when, they're, when people do have income, when they've got money, when they've got jobs, they buy, they spend that money, they pay their bills, they buy goods, and then companies can hire more people to produce more goods and more services, and it spirals upwards. But what you have right now in the political situation, which I think is un-American, is you have Republicans who have said, period, we're not going to create another job. And worse than that, worse than that, they're killing jobs. You know what's happened over the past two months, while there's been some job growth in the private sector, it hasn't been fast enough, but there's been some job growth in the private sector, public employees, 450,000 public employees have lost their jobs. Teachers are being laid off, public employees are being laid off. And in the state, in this state, you have the example of the governor of the state. He ran on jobs, 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 and as soon as he got in office, he started killing jobs. He started cutting back on teachers. He, he, he's gutting education to lay off more teachers. He's gutting local government to lay off more public employees at the private level, at, at, the, at the local level. Uh, and those are jobs being lost just as fast as the private sector can create them. Well, there's, uh, there, there's no appetite in this country for another stimulus. There's, no. There certainly should be because that's what's needed. You have economists like Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman saying that's exactly what we need. Government has is the only one who can create jobs. There's sure, sure plenty of oh, things that need true. to be done. There's sure plenty of things that need to be done. And you've got even worse than that, not only are you cutting employment at the state level and the local level and at every school all across Wisconsin and all across the United States, but your Republicans are insisting we've got to continue to cut taxes for the only people who have jobs, the people with all the money, the wealthy, the wealthiest people at the top are getting tax cuts, so the unemployed people aren't paying taxes, and the wealthiest people who do have money to pay taxes are paying less in taxes, so of course the state it has bigger and bigger deficits. I'd like to respond if I could. The public sector does not create jobs. It creates an environment that makes it easier to, the to create jobs. The only time that but the, but the private the sector the only people who can jobs. create jobs at the time the private sector Joel, is not creating Joel, you're jobs wrong is about the public jobs sector. being lost here in Wisconsin since January 1. The Department of Workforce Development has charted job growth, and there have been thousands and thousands of jobs created in Wisconsin. At so the same governor, time, governor Walker is well on his pace. Being laid his off. promise of creating 250,000 oh, right. And jobs by 2015. All right, let's put the spotlight here in uh, Wisconsin. So much is happening in Wisconsin politics this week. Republicans keep pushing their agenda items as they promised they would. Concealed carry, school choice, cuts in state aid, collective bargaining. Supporters love it, but the Democrats are convinced the Republicans are digging their own graves and that will all come back to haunt them and become apparent in the recall elections. Denise, you think that's true? I think it is going to, the recall elections are going to be very, very tough for some Republicans. And some Republicans are going to lose their seats. Some of these things are coming back to haunt them. Um, I don't know that it's going to be concealed carry or voter ID. I think it's a collective bargaining issue um, and the loss of state aid that really is going to drive some people to really get, uh, do their very best to get out and to work hard to, um, to defeat some of the um, Republicans who are likely to be, um, who are up for recall. Um, you know, I, I think that the challenge that we have is that it, it's as if we've seen the floodgates loosed, and, you know, over as, since January, where it's, you know, perhaps all the things that people wanted to do, they're doing now, they're doing them all at one time, and it seems to be done without any kind of, of opportunity for real debate and discussion about the critical, criticalness of these issues that face us. Um, so collectively, <coughs> it, it feels as if this state has gone through um, a metamorphosis that not everyone agrees with. 
And I think for some Republicans, some of the things that have been done are going to make it very, very hard for them to retain their seats. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that that's, that's, that's the reality of what we're facing here. I think some of them feel that, too, because I think that's part of the reason we saw some of the changes that were made at Joint Finance Committee before the budget uh, before the budget moved forward in terms of bringing some state aid back to schools very little but some um, making some decisions to put some additional dollars back into recycling you know those are things that are starting to come back so you know it's as if the pendulum swung so much um, that there were all kinds <clears throat> of opportunities for people to become unhappy um, and for some people, I think they will pay for it with their jobs. All right, so I'm, so I'm walking down State Street in Madison this week, and in the window really? there's, all, there's all these <laughs> stickers, recall Walker, recall them all, blah, blah, blah. Do you think that sentiment, which is strong in Madison, granted that's a world in itself, will that sentiment it's a galaxy in itself. last until January, or will that wear off? I think the current angst after the budget is passed and people go home and celebrate the 4th of July and go on their summer vacations and fall arrives, I think that will subside. But I think then that fever will will be back again come January because there is this this notion that uh, that they can recall uh, the governor. I think that's just pie in the sky fantasy island. Do you, do you understand how difficult it would be to recall a governor, what you have to do in the short amount of time? And, and, and I don't think this governor is as unpopular as that side of the room says. Uh, he's asking public employees to pay a, just a little bit more towards <laughs> their benefits. That is not considered outrageous or well, radical have, by have most, agreed, of, the, have most to do it. of the common sense public They have in this, agreed to do it. That's not state. the issue. So, not the issue. you know, that's not the issue. Re re recalling the governor, that, you know, that, that's just not, it's just not going to happen. I don't believe that any of the recall senators, uh, Democrat or Republican, now no, no election is, is in the bag, is, is, is simple, but... Um, uh, I, I don't think any of them are going to be recalled. It's tough to find opponents. It, it, it's, it's tough to run, run a campaign in a short amount of time and raise money in the middle of the of the summer. And I don't think you should be recalled simply because you took a vote that somebody uh, didn't like. But, you, but, should, you should be recalled because of malfeasance or a major scandal or a crime. You shouldn't be recalled because you stayed in Madison and did your job. But the reality is that the Democrats are meeting in Milwaukee this weekend, mm -hmm. and yeah. they are pumped about the possibility that Russ Feingold maybe will take on Walker. Would that be a big fight? I actually, I think uh, it's more likely Russ Feingold will run for senator, uh, which I yep, I agree uh, is is a natural position for him. But there are plenty of good Democrats that are going to run against Walker come January. Uh, I'd, I'd pick out John Erpenbach or Peter Barca as likely uh, opponents. Uh, and I, I think the way this whole thing is has played out, uh, and the Republicans, I have to say, are really doing the Democrats an enormous favor. By passing the worst possible versions of everything, every bad piece of legislation they've ever dreamed of passing, whether it's concealed carry, which outrages the uh, police chief in Milwaukee and, and every other law enforcement official all over this state, uh, or uh, voter ID where you won't even accept the IDs of, of, of universities in Wisconsin for students to vote just so you can disenfranchise students. I mean, the worst possible things they can do, they're just piling it all in as fast as they can because they see those recalls coming. And I'm Sorry, Kevin. Uh, Republicans are going to lose at least three senators and oh, possibly you, you want that and to possibly happen. five. That probably won't. Possibly happen. five, and, and the Democrats know that. And and winning those this summer is going to build towards they they're these all those petitions that they got all those signatures and they're collecting names right now for people that are ready to sign the petition against Scott Walker as soon as it's legal to sign petition. How many yeah, Democrats think, are up for recall? They're going to have half a million how, how, signatures. How many, how many Democrats uh, are up for recall right now? None. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, because, because in fact, the Democrats are very supportive of the people they elected who did exactly what they said they would do. They fought as hard as they could against this horrible legislation to kill collective or bargaining. Or maybe the Government Accountability Board just hasn't gotten around to, now, what, to it, certifying well, that they're going to call elected. The maybe, Government Accountability Board has, 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 has had a lot to do. Has, has, <laughs> they've had a lot to do. They've had to do the entire recall of um, and, and, the, and the recount for the state's Supreme Court race, in large part because of the questions that were raised about uh, what happened in Waukesha County, where you lose 14,000 votes, then you find them again. The other issues that they've had votes. to deal with have 
have really dealt with making sure and being very careful about this recall process. They've not gone at it willy-nilly. You know, Kevin Kennedy has a great reputation as being someone who is very careful, who is very conscientious, and that's what he's doing. That's the process yeah. he's doing, and that's the process I think we all want him to do. I don't think we all want him to say, well, let's have everything on one day, even if I'm not sure and haven't, Actually, haven't, haven't had the same process that I've gone through for the Democrats who are about ready to be recalled as I did for the Republicans. Actually, it's, it's very so interesting I, I think that, it's, it's that, a smart the, thing to do. that the whole reason the Government Accountability Board needs to take more time to check out the challenges about these petitions trying to recall Democrats is, they had is, first, is vote fraud, which they had first. Is, they is, is signature fraud. These The Republicans who claim they have to make it harder for everybody in the state to vote because they're so concerned about fraud, you had an organization from Utah in here passing around petitions to recall Democrats and lying to people, saying this is a petition to recall Scott Walker, this is a petition to give Indians more rights to vote on their reservations. You know, they, they told blatant lies, they bought votes with shots of whiskey and bars, and, and there are all kinds of complaints about the fraud of, yeah, of this outside organization. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dead people signing the petition. Yeah, about, Democrats would never do smoke for votes. Well, I guess we, now, about now we know, but we do and, know, and, because and, and, we and, do know because of the process process that the Government Accountability Board went through, that those signatures on the recalls that they have certified are accurate. The same thing and the same amount of time needs to be taken to make sure that those signatures are accurate when it comes to those Democratic senators that may be recalled. Funny how they were able to determine that for six Republicans, but gee, just... We just, because, don't we, just don't we just don't know. We just don't know. We just don't know about and those Democrat those senators. Those recall petitions were in first. And so those were recalls were in, were in first. first. Some of the ones <laughs> no, that were Democrats the, the were in first. The first ones that were in were the Speak ones that were Republicans. Here. All right, <laughs> next am. topic. Next topic. Dr. Jack Kevorkian died at the age of 83 today. Known as Dr. Death, Kevorkian assisted more than 100 people with suicide. He argued it was a compassionate way of helping them avoid long, long continued suffering. Others called it murder, and Kevorkian actually ended up spending eight years in prison for his actions. No matter what you think, he certainly influenced the discussions that we've had recently about end-of-life care in this country, Denise. Um, he has, and I'm, I, there are discussions that we need to have in this country. The end of life, um, we now have the ability to prolong life for such a long period of time. We do need to have discussions about what that quality of life needs to be. And, and I think of that's the legacy we want to take a look at with Dr. Kevorkian. That's it. That it's caused us as a, as, a, as a nation to take a look at those kinds of issues. You know, for more people to take a look at having a living will. For more people to make it very clear what they want the end of their life to be like. So there's some dignity in, in death. Um, and so often in this country there is not for so many people. So I, I think for us to have those kinds of discussions, it's, it's, it's a good thing for us to have. You know, but it, it's very difficult you know, for, for whatever reason in this country, unlike many countries in Europe and, and parts of Africa for that matter, we have great difficulty talking about the end of life, as if the end of life is an unnatural thing, when in mm -hmm. fact it is very natural. So we, we still need to continue to have those discussions to decide, particularly as technology gives us, and medical advancements give us greater ability to keep people alive, what the end of one's life should look like. And, and people do need to have some ability to be able to make those decisions about what they want the end of their lives to be like based on what their beliefs are, not on what medical technology can do. What, what about the argument that some people have that, that uh, they argue God should make the decision when your life ends. You and God should make the decision, not your doctor. Well, I'm very anti-euthanasia. Uh, uh, I, I believe J Dr. Jack Kevorkian was the poster child for the proliferation of the culture of death. He e exemplified the lengths people will go to to justify egregious behavior uh, by using the excuse that it's to relieve pain or suffering. He talks about the right to die some people see that as a slippery slope to the duty to die. The founder of the Hemlock Society said that, uh, you know, it's a matter of economics, that these people need to go because they're being a burden on the health care system uh, because, of the, because of the costs that are being imposed to, to take care of them. I think euthanasia dehumanizes human life. You can't talk about, you know, dying with dignity when Dr. Jack Kevorkian operated out of a beat-up van with dingy uh, curtains in, in, in the windows. 
Um, I will say that uh, he was fortunate. He died today of natural causes, unlike some of his lucky patients who had to have doctors there looking over them and taking their lives. And look at the Netherlands, where it's not only uh, legal but popular. You have doctors in, 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 in that uh, area of the world who are taking the lives of people without, without them even requesting it. it it's, it's, it's dangerous. It's, it's, it's risky. I don't like it. I, 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 I see it. it's only legal in, in one state, and there's a reason for that. There's, there's, there's something inhumane about this. You know, but he, somebody asked him in an interview once, uh, how does it feel when you kill somebody? And he said, I, I'm not killing the person. I feel like I'm stopping their suffering. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're ever in a hospice situation and you're exposed to that, you understand that, that response. Yeah, yeah, and he, Dr. Kevorkian was a zealot and uh, an extremist. There's no question about that. But the issue that he was dealing with is a serious issue. Uh, Kevin is, has expressed his religious belief about the end of life. And I understand that. Uh, but what I've always been opposed is other people imposing their religion through the law. Um, I, that's the most objectionable thing about the abortion debate. Um, that's the most objectionable thing about much of this debate over end of life. Uh, the truth of the matter is families, for as long as anyone remembers, have been making end of life decisions for their loved ones. And it's, it's mostly been against the law and it's mostly been um, informal, um, uh, a, a understanding between the doctor and the family that this person has suffered enough. Uh, sure, we can, we have machines now that can keep, keep people, uh, you know, if, if you define life by uh, being hooked up to machine, uh, we, can, we can have those machines run forever. Uh, but the family comes to an understanding at some point that this isn't doing their loved one any good. This isn't doing them any good. Uh, and, and that it's a humane thing to let this life end. Otherwise. Because they're not going to go on forever. Uh, but I understand people who have religious uh, objections to that, and they should not make those decisions then. But they should not impose their religious beliefs on others through the law. Is part of the reason he was controversial, he had kind of a kooky personality. Well, I mean, he, he, he did have, he, 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 he did have a bit of a kooky personality. But I, I think he realized that, as, as, as Joel was saying, families and individuals make decisions all the time about how their lives are going to end. Um, some people, and I know this, this happened in my family with one of my uncles who had suffered from cancer for a long time, um, he didn't have the option of saying, this is what I would like to do to have my life end with dignity. So he took his own life. We have people in this country who are suffering, who know their suffering will continue, and the only option that we have available for them is continue to suffer or take your life in your own hands. I think as a country, we are greater and more compassionate than offering people those two options, suffer or take your own life. And, and I think that the, the discussions that Dr. Kevorkian started, if we're going to be honest and fair to, to ourselves, we need to be able to continue. Not easy discussions, but they're ones that we have to have. Okay. Back to politics for just a minute. You know, with everyone focusing on these recall elections this summer, it's hard to remember the 2012 election for Congress and for president is already well underway. Well, Rick Horwitz saw plenty of evidence of that in two Washington meetings this week. Rick. There's this old line in politics, where you stand depends on where you sit. Translation, Democrats and Republicans see things very differently, including, it turns out, how they see Barack Obama. Here's a Thursday evening headline from the Huffington Post's website. Obama rebuffs Democratic plea to be more forceful. This is after the president met with congressional Democrats at the White House. They wanted him to dial up the rhetoric against the GOP, to stop being such a namby-pamby. And here's what's so interesting about that. The Dems visited on Thursday, but the congressional Republicans had been there on Wednesday, and their complaint? Obama was being too hard on them. No, really. They said he was mischaracterizing their budget proposals, that he was demagoguing their plans for overhauling Medicare, calling it a voucher program, for instance. It's not a voucher program, they say. It's a premium support program. Oh. See, people don't like things called voucher programs. Apparently, it reminds them that there won't actually be enough money to go around. 
that in this case, more and more of the health care burden will fall on the shoulders of people less and less able to pay for it which is a pretty fair summary of what Paul Ryan's Medicare plan would do if it ever became law. But that voucher label the president keeps putting on it, he's distorting our position, they say. He's not being fair. That sound you hear is the pot calling the kettle black. Or do you think that portraying Barack Obama as a Kenyan socialist pushing job-killing bailouts and grandma-killing death panels was all just good, clean fun? Oh. Here's the Republicans' problem in a nutshell. They had certain expectations about the guy in the Oval Office. They thought they could say anything about him and he wouldn't push back. They thought they could say anything, no matter how ridiculous or inflammatory, about his policies and his programs, and he wouldn't get down in the mud with them. They thought he was their punching bag. Turns out he's a counterpuncher, and there's some sting in those fists. Somebody needs to tell the Democrats. Well, thanks, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.